We're almost there, Henrik, my dear co-host. This is the second last film of our International Cinema Challenge. Ain't that right? Yeah, it is. Fortunately, we have a guest to help us out. In this episode, he's called Matt. Welcome to the show. Hi, thank you for having me. No, no, th- thank you for joining us. Yeah, I think we are definitely going to need some help in this episode as we're talking about a South African comedy from from 1980 that includes a lot of interesting points that we can delve into. But Matt, who are you? Um, well, I'm I'm a South African. I, I'm a software a software engineer currently working in the U.S. You don't ha- currently have plans to go back to South Africa or any kind of inklings like that. Um. Possibly. I'm not 100% sure. We may end up moving elsewhere uh, as well. It's all so, uh, sort of sort of up in, in, in the air, and I don't really know at this point. So. Yeah, Yeah. maybe you don't need to know. Uh, just <laughs> take your time, since I think we're all pretty young still. Yeah, let life go as it, as it goes, right? Exactly. Yeah, as many of our listeners might know, I am Finnish, and my co-host Henrik is also Finnish. On my part, I live in Poland, Warsaw, and Henrik in the Santa Claus city of Rovaniemi. <laughs> <laughs> Have you had any drinking pals lately? Any of those reindeers coming popping to your house? <laughs> <laughs> thankfully, not yet, and thankfully, not that many tourists. Also, not yet. Mark. We are we are just waiting with ever growing terror the heydays. Like once the season once again fully kicks in, big way. Oh boy. Speaking of reindeers and Santa Clauses, there is a certain point that is connected to that. That is a Coca-Cola bottle that features in tonight's film in this, the most commercially successful release in the history of South Africa's film industry, I might add, released in 1980. Matt, what's your experience with this film? How did you, or when did you first come to see this film? I just grew up watching this movie. It, it was... It was part of a culture from long before I was born, really. And so, so I don't know when the first time I watched it is. It's just always been in my life. I've understood that it's uh, something of a cultural phenomenon that everybody was watching in the 80s or even 90s or even now. I've heard of some stories of children watching this at home like almost every day. <laughs> yeah, it... Uh, in my household, we, we, we never got th- that far, but we would probably watch it at least once or twice a year. It's to, um, because to us, it, it 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 was sort of the the entire Disney catalog, but for South Africa, there there was there wasn't really that much that you you could go and see of South African movies, and so it allowed us to feel like we were. Almost in the movies, if if you will, because you know the the rest of the movies, mm. while well, they take place in England or America or Germany, but not not really in South Africa. So, right. So very much a South African movie, although it, the budget was given by the South African government and the director is from South Africa, and all the key members, as I understand, are from South Africa. The film was still filmed in Botswana. Maybe budgetary yes. reasons, I'm not sure. Um, no, the, so 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 it's it's both filmed and set in Botswana, mm. and so while it's not really South Africa, we we don't we don't really treat Botswana as, as like somewhere else. It's just another part of the, of the area, if you will. It's a different government, but it it's it's still Southern Africa. So it, it's it's still our people. Okay, and South Africa and Botswana, as I understand, are. Some of the top democracies in Africa. Yeah, I, th- I think Botswana, is, from a good governance standpoint, is doing better than South Africa. But both countries uh, that are doing quite well com- uh, compared to our other neighbors. And this film actually got a sequel as well. Was it a couple of years later? The only official sequel, actually, for this film, The Gods Must Be Crazy 2. And I noticed that there is The Gods Must, Must Be Crazy 3, and there's also, was it The, the Gods Must Be Funny in China, where yeah, also there, the there, same actor appears. Yeah, there, there were three more sort of unofficial sequels that were produced in Hong Kong that I've actually never seen but have one they've been on my list for a while if, if i could just get a copy of them 
Yeah. So this film is directed by Jamie. How do you pronounce this last name? Do you know? Ace. Ace. Um, yeah. Yeah. You. Um, it's technically not uh, not the same as the, uh, the Ace card in in your deck of cards. But if you pronounce it that 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 way, no one will give you the side eye. So. <laughs> okay. That sounds good. Yeah, this is a film about a member of the San Aboriginal tribe. It proved to be an international hit. Portrays this character from this tribe who comes in contact with this outside world artifact that is to drop from a plane, a Coca-Cola bottle. And that kind of starts to set all the wheels in motion in the film. Henrik, what's your experience with this film? Unfortunately, I don't to really have an experience with the film. This was the first time I've really ever seen The Guards Must Be Crazy. It's had, it, it is kind of one of those films that I have been aware of. I, I've heard that the film exists and there has been kind of this growing need to at some time seek it out and check it out. But I've never actually got around to do that. Yeah, what could be the reason for it to be such a big success, Matt? Any thoughts because this this was the world's biggest non-us box office hit at the time um you you know i i don't really know i i, I know why it was a success in south africa obviously it, it was hmm. finally us being on on the world st- stage of of movies personally i think it's a it's a good film but i don't know what managed to get it that much success <laughs> yeah, like over a hundred million dollars outside of uh, the country of its origin. That's that's pretty good success indeed. The sequel was less successful, as I understand it. Yeah, I I, I think the sequel might might actually have been a better movie, but yeah, that's that that's personal opinion. Right, probably got a bigger budget after this one. Yeah, I'm I'm not completely sure about about this, but when I was checking the film out. I, I got the feeling that there may be two factors that my, might uh, kind of explain the popularity of, of the movie. The first one being the kind of exotic nature of it. This this being a South African film and therefore something that you, especially back in the 1980s, you most likely wouldn't have experienced before. So that, that might kind of drive the masses in. That they need to actually see what is South African cinema. The another factor that came into my mind as I was w- watching this was that this might kind of be the Yellen situation once again, mm. where where the time period and the region from which the film comes from. Unfortunately, back in the day, it was very problematic. The apartheid, and once again, like, like Yellen, which came from a region that was very much inflicted by slavery. And the films coming from that region often carry the, the slavery as very hard knitting pol- political point in them. Yellen, as an as a individual movie, really didn't touch upon the subject matter. And that might be something that also happens in The Gods Must Be Crazy. It comes from a region that is being touched by the apartheid. It comes from the time period that is also very... Where, where apartheid was... Where, where it was going strong. But the film itself doesn't really tackle apartheid. And you, you don't really see apartheid in the film, which once again to Western audiences might make this an easygoing experience. Kind of like you, you can... Watch this with with a clean conscience. Yeah, this is definitely the kind of film that seems to split opinions, and maybe the fact that there could be something racist in it, as some people have suggested, was driving the general interest towards this film, as this was also banned in several countries due to this belief that this movie is indeed racist. But uh, as far as I can see, this film is making light fun of everybody and everything. So I wouldn't sign that opinion. It's kind of a do or die th- type of situation, really. Like, I, I can... like the, the film uses certain tropes that, especially in modern times, often are tied with, with racist attitudes. This being the noble savage, the faraway miracle land. Those two tropes kind of being the most obvious, the most, the strongest ones in the film. 
those both both of those tropes they kind of a, they they do carry the weight of of racism with them. Do, does that mean that that this film as an individual piece of cinema itself is is racist? I wouldn't take it that far, but I can I can see how how those tropes kind of can really rub someone in the wrong way. We can dissect all that during the scene by scene that we do here, usually at the laboratory. But let's talk about Botswana shortly. So it's one of the most successful continuous democracies in Africa. Unfortunately, there are many problems. For for example, HIV AIDS is concerning 20% of the population which are infected with it. And 50% of all households in Botswana own cattle. So it's quite something different when you compare to... Finland, for example. Yeah, it's a, it's a very um, agrarian uh, society. There's not much industrialization, although the Botswana government has actually been trying to skip over a lot of the you know, steps of industrialization of the textiles and, and stuff like that and get more into an, uh, an information economy, which would be great and, and, and helpful to them, but being a landlocked country can also be kind of difficult for, for them with that because they're dependent on South Africa and Namibia for connections to the internet. So mm. they're, they're both hampered by geography and by politics. That causes you know a compounding effect. Right. And also something that concerns tonight's film, the sound people that are prominent in the film yeah, but Botswana is trying to step up in an effort to improve the conditions of their minorities, and I believe specifically the San people. Yeah, they, they've been uh, putting forth a, a lot of e- uh, effort to both provide them with the necessary modern services, you know, good, good medical care, etc., et whilst still allowing them to live their traditional li- uh, lifestyle if, if they want to and getting it into into a situation wh- uh, where people can choose to live that traditional lifestyle or you know move to Cabrone and participate in, in the modern economy and maybe just do that for a, f- a few years and, th- and then move back and a lot of tension that uh, that that's that's going on between or amongst the cultures in, in Botswana that's happening with that so it's it's quite interesting to uh, to watch and I'm glad I'm not having to make any of those decisions mm, certainly yeah there is uh, still south africa to go through maybe you are the best to describe south africa <laughs> in in some short way if you can give some kind of a wrap up like how's the economy doing and South Africa's economy for the last se- uh, century or more has primarily been focused ar- um, around mining, a lot of mineral resources. The whole reason Johannesburg a- as a city has been able to grow to its size in such a, quite frankly, strange location for a city, it's not on a major river, it's not on the ocean, etc., uh, et is because the whole economy is so centered ar- around the, uh, the mining industry, and that's where the mining industry p- uh, puts all their research and uh, and all of that. It is a fairly industrialized eco- economy, again, with then all of the, uh, the industry moving in, in, into Johannesburg, because that's where the, uh, the, uh, the, the mining was, so that's where the manufacturing goes. But th- there, there are a lot of political problems, and at, at, the, at the time when this movie w- uh, w- was produced, this sort of almost a low-level civil war that was going on in, in South Africa between the apartheid government and the majority black population was reaching a crescendo. And so you would have uh, all of this internal tension combined with international tension, South Africa under sanctions, etc., causing something where people would like to focus on, uh, on something different because the, the news was just depressing. Is it true what we hear from the BBC and the, all the news outlets nowadays that there is still a considerable amount of racial tension in South Africa? Or how do you see it as a South African? Yes, it's different uh, racial tension, but there's still a, a, a lot of sort of history of, of apartheid 
bearing down and causing it, uh, inequality that the ANC government have be, been unable and uh, and in, in some ways somewhat unwilling to solve. And what what I mean by uh, by that is, uh, is that there have been clear misappropriations of money that could have been uh, used to, uh, to to solve that that have just you know gone missing or gone to BMW. <laughs> so um, there's been a lot of uh, issue with that. Yeah. The, what, what's what's different now is that it's not nearly as baked into everything you do in uh, in, in, in society. There's still some of it there to, to a certain ex- extent, and you, you'll you'll see this like if you go to a restaurant, the vast majority of the, uh, uh, of the time your your waiter's going uh, going to be black, and a lot of the, uh, of the time the owners go, uh, of of the restaurant is going to be white, and so. You still do see that that racial divide in, in in society, but because it's no longer being forced onto people, it, it's slowly healing. But it's it's going to take a lot of time. Indeed, there's a lot of terminology as well that has changed since since the release of this film. For example, the term or the word bushman. I don't know if this is any more in use. Or is it just that people call them the San people? Um, so, so in some circles, it's it's considered a a, a, a little bit derogatory. It's, it's not really. It, it, yeah, it, it's it's not really considered that racist, but it's like a little bit uncouth. Like you could say mm. something better, not ra- rather than oh, I can't believe you said Bushman. But yeah. Bushman, much much like the term that. Is now considered much more racist. Of Hottentot doesn't really describe a single group of people. It 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 describes a bunch of uh, of, of groups of of people who aren't really that closely related to uh, to each other. I mean, like right. the San people, their languages are actually in, uh, entirely different. To um, so so. I promise you, I will butcher this. I will give it. I will give it my my best shot, and then I'm just uh, uh, and and then from from then on, I'm just going to a- accept my de- uh, defeat because. Trust me, it will be the best shot of this show. White white people can't say click consonants. It's just it, it's. It, I I've, actually have met some white people who can't say click consonants, but people who grew up speaking Indo-European languages can't say click consonant consonants. And I, I think it's trauma, but I'm not sure. And wow. those are two two distinct clicks. Uh, the 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 exclamation mark X is in the front and middle of your uh, uh, of your mouth, and then the the sort of double cross T, if you if you will, is like in in the side of your mouth, like right in your cheek. If I got my linguistics on uh, on that correct, which I I, I may not have. <laughs> But uh, he's he 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 actually speaks in an, an entirely different lang- language group. It's as closely re- uh, re- related to Khoi Khoi as uh, like Finnish is to English, which is to say, basically not at all. Hmm. Uh, yeah, this is uh, called often as the Namibia's most famous actor and has acted in Gods Must Be Crazy and its sequel and sequels and. Uh, did not know his exact age, did not know the value of paper money. I understand he got $300 for doing this film. And uh, I'm not sure what actually happened to it. Did he just, just use it immediately or just blew it, like destroyed it or threw it away? Or So so, so it's actually a, a bit of a misconception about the, the $300. That was his first earnings check. Okay. Um, and I, I can't I, I I don't have any more information about what exactly ha- uh, happened to it other other than that the, the sources do say lit, allowed it to literally blow away in the wind so right. I'm assuming that he just did he, he didn't get what it, uh, what what it was and so he put it uh, he he put it down and and then it blew off but I don't know but his actual sort of overall uh, uh, official earnings from the film was two thousand dollars. Which still not exactly better than three hundred dollars, considering what the movie made. Hey? And before the director died, he also gave twenty thousand dollars extra. And uh, was it the monthly yes. stipend to kind I, of improve I, I, on I, that? 
but still, yeah. it would be interesting to know what the other actors of the film have earned and kind of compare that. Of course, I think at this point, uh, this actor <laughs> is a newcomer, so he might be coming off with a smaller wage, but yeah, come on, 2000 or 20000 it doesn't sound like much. Yeah, I, I would I would guess that uh, that Maria Svea has ma- made about that uh, that much it, uh, in the first year. I, d- I don't know that for sure, but that's just my guess about it. Yeah. All right. In the trailer, it proclaims that this is a quote an epic comedy of absurd proportions. Let's see if it is. So, Henrik, Matt, are you ready for scene by scene analysis? Not ready as ever. <laughs> yeah, ready as I'll ever be. <laughs> <laughs> so we start with the introduction of the some people or Bushmen, and there is the mention of quote except the little people of Kalahari. Nobody else can withstand the Kalahari desert except the Sam people. And this intro voice or this narrator voice has been seen as demeaning or belittling or something that somebody didn't see in a very good light that they are kind of making fun of these little people in the Kalahari. What we do know here at the lab is that Already in the 80s, the Sam people had already left some of their traditional ways, and some of them were wondering during the film, why are we still doing for the film these things that we no longer do? For example, some of these hunter-gatherer practices, so that can be understandable. Growing up, I never thought much much about that that, that introduction, but when I rewatched it to, uh, for this podcast, I did find it a little bit jarring. It 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 was sort of the the whole uncontacted tribe t- uh, uh, type trope, which really has not existed in, in Southern Africa in maybe a century. It, it it could be a bit a bit less than that, but certainly by uh, by the time the, the movie was was made, uh, wasn't there. And at first, it, it it took me a little bit bit aback. But when 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 I thought about it more, I, I I was wondering was this an attempt at framing it initially as see, see this, this uncontacted tribe in order to later subvert that expectation by showing how even if they are an uncontacted uh, uh, tribe, he has the same sort of critical thinking and, and everything at, uh, as what you'd mm. expect from someone in Johannesburg. Hmm. Interesting. I did like some of the things that the narrator mentioned about the ways of the Sun people, like, quote, in their world there is no evil, or that they apologize for killing the animal that they will be having for dinner, if these are true. But then again, if you put that in their world, there is no evil quote in a different context, which you could interpret easily, because isn't during this narration, there there is this moment where this one of the Sun guys is killing a snake. So it could be played for humorous purposes. Well, but but it it does say uh, I I think I think it says even the snake's uh, not evil as, as long as you avoid the pointy end. Something um, like that, yeah. Yeah, that is a, a little bit in, in their culture, and I, I've not been able to find too much uh, uh, about this. But, uh, but from what I understand, there's not really this the same sort of good and evil di- uh, diametrically opposed I- idea in, in, in their culture as we tend to uh, tend to have in uh, Western culture. It's it's not that things are good or evil. It's uh, it's that they have these different points of view and and different reasons for what they do. And it's sort of the walking walking a mile and and someone's shoes thing. You have to understand why they do that before uh, b- before you can judge them, which we we do ha- we do have, but we also often choose the good versus e- e- evil trope because it's just it, it, it's easy and it makes great movies <laughs> yeah the coca-cola bottle arrives now from the skies so it's dropped from the, from an airplane into the kalahari desert and it causes issues immediately inside the community because it is an object that is put into good use in any kind of a daily practices and because there's only one of these items they have to fight for it 
and because the fight ensues, then one of these guys decides that, or actually our leading star of the night decides that this has to be buried and uh, taken away. But it's digged out by Hyena, and then it's back. And then uh, this same guy decides to go to the ends of the earth to throw it away from the edge of earth. And that's where he gets to at the end of the movie. Henrik, is this film racist? <laughs> I, I I wouldn't say it, I I wouldn't say it's racist. I I I can see very strongly where where that reading might come from. Mm. That be, being most notably that being being the tropes and like the opening narration points this out the untouched bit uncivilized but still so woke and so in contact with the real world noble savages. It's it's kind of a, the trope itself is kind of a being brought down by by racism and that being somewhat of a racist worldview. But one, once again, I'm not voting the individual film for that. Yeah, it uses a trope that has a lot of package, especially these days. But when watching the film, I don't get the feeling that the film itself tries to be racist or even mean towards towards the tribe that it paints a picture of. And as discussed, there is uh, quite a bit of different storylines that intertwine in some ways. And there is this attack on the government building by some Boha's troops. I kept kind of wondering if this is drawing, this character is drawing parallels to something that happened in real life. So... I, I actually I actually did, did some research about that in, in particular because it looked like some of the Angolan communists and uh, Swapo uh, rebels in the South African border war. And so I think Samboha is supposed to be representative of that because at, at the time this was released, South Africa was fighting a border war on the northern border of what is now, uh, now Namibia. And... The, the Southwest African People's Organization, or SWAPO, was trying to get independence for Namibia, while South Africa was essentially fighting a Cold War proxy war on the U.S.'s behalf against uh, it, it attempted um, Soviet expansion into Angola. And uh, so you, you, you get him mentioned as, as communist, and obviously he has the, the Karl Marx and, and and everything so i think that there's a little bit of comparing to to the border war a little bit of of swapo and that he's a, he's a guerrilla and and everything although swapo they were called communist by the government of south africa at the time but you know anyone who was who was against what the government was doing was called communist so yeah. that that that's not really a big thing it it, it was uh Absolutely, the Red Scare. It was Diroy Khafar. I think they tried to uh, uh, amalgamate everything that was going on there, but then also they they made it occur against an unnamed uh, uh, African government. They very intentionally they they used a bunch of real places, but they mixed them up in uh, in, in in such a way to make it that no such place could could exist. They, the, the cities that they sort of zoom on the map to is roughly where Kinshasa is, but then the the name that they gave for the city, which I I don't remember what what it was, it, so they 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 mm. were very int- in- intentionally making this not a, uh, a a real thing, while having very heavy overtones of the South African border war. Okay, yeah, yeah, this uh, could be some of those points that makes this a very timely film and when it was released of course and that could be kind of contributing why we might be losing some of the funny parts of the film possibly when it relates to boha at least but yeah now the boha's troops are hiding under the trees and there is this hench guy who is thrown out of the helicopter well from a very low altitude so this is only for intimidation purposes and uh, then they find the team boha with the help of this guy and and uh, how do you pronounce this? Uh, is it Gi Gi something like this? Uh, so so that's a uh, a click in like the, the very center of your mouth. Oh dear. So, <laughs> yeah. It, uh, I 
Uh, honestly, probably the closest uh, um, w- uh, way to pronounce it would just be with a K, just Ki. Okay, I think I'm going to go with that, <laughs> to not embarrass myself. So Ki no- negotiates with the very wise baboon about the bottle, who gives it up. And uh, there is a random looking insert of a cityscape uh, with voices that tell that somebody wants to go to Botswana. It's referring to the earlier moment where we met this office lady who wants to go to Botswana now to uh, do her work as a school teacher. And now the elephant wakes up and the biologist is inspecting its, well, droppings, as Mr. Stain does in this film. Inspecting the manure, let's say, of different animals. We are introduced to Mpudi, who is uh, whining under the car and probably fixing also the car so that they can get get a move on. There's also the reverend in this scene. This is uh, played by the director himself. So then Stain leaves with the Land Rover and Key wonders what it was in the Kalahari Desert. Was it enormous snakes or what? because he has completely not had any touch to the outside world. So that's what is the first thought of a guy who sees the tracks of the car. Now Kate Thompson arrives and uh, she is admiring the throwing of the bags into the bus. I think she's looking at the kind of the efficiency that is going on. Or it could be like, oh my god, why are they doing it like this to my stuff? Yeah, it, it's... So So I, to me that was sort of, this is a... Um... This is this is your your welcome to uh, to Africa. I, I'm not clear why they tr- they chose an American accent for Kate, imp- implying that she w- would be American and thus even more d- uh, disconnected from uh, from this. Or may- maybe I'm just mistaking w- uh, what accent they w- they were going for uh, with, with Sandra Pr- Prince's character. But there's a common trope. Of you know the 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 goat on the on the uh, car roof and the and the chickens w- wandering around around of oh look you're not in the first world any uh, anymore well, welcome to Africa and so it's it's using I think it's using her as a proxy for any audience uh, members who would be surprised by that Sandra Prinsloo who actually has performed in like hundred different productions and often playing in lead roles. And has also some roles, in, some major roles in, for example, Target of an Assassin from 79. There is a bunch of Afrikaans films with purely Afrikaans titles that I definitely can't pronounce. Henrik, did you find anything interesting? Not that much, and not on her. Like the main, I would say the main star, uh, CV and actor credit wise would be Marius Weyers, who play who plays kind of the white male lead of the film. A- about him, there is a- actually quite a lot. Him pretty much being, I-, I guess, from in in most of the films that somehow tie with Africa as a region, and also films that that have quote unquote so- South Africanist character in it, like. He he was in Blood Diamond, right? The but basically the diamond trade unethicalness. The film of two thousand six. He was in Gandhi, and he he was even in the Deep Ocean. The thing alien mix rip off horror film Deep Star Six. Hmm. Yeah, ba- basically, if if you have a film which needs a character name, Bun something. That that's wh- that's when Marius all of a sudden appears. <laughs> now the biologist is taking Kate Thompson on board the Land Rover, and they drive off, but get stuck in the mud once again. Now with the girl, and the girl is not very impressed by this. Neither is she impressed by doing all this goofy stuff throughout the film because apparently he's so infatuated by Kate Thompson. Not not even infatuated by Kate Thompson, like the character makes consistent remarks on how somehow every time he meets a woman and this later gets turned into every time I meet a lady, but originally the statement goes that simply basically any woman if he comes in contact with with 
a member of an opposite sex. Somehow his brains immediately turn off, and he <laughs> he lo- loses all the motorics of his body and can't pre- pretty much can't do anything. And as as we see with the Kate episode, when when he's kind of driving the car to to even to pick up Kate, well, you you gotta see that he doesn't even have to have to share space with a woman to kind of already lose all his brain powers and and, and rationality and logics. It, it he simply needs to think about a woman. And everything already goes to shit. Yeah, this what we see on the screen is called often slapstick. Henrik, was it funny for you? To be seeing this Land Rover in the mud. And to be completely honest, not the least. <laughs> like I and and this is this is a this is a kind of a matter of of preference. I'm I'm not the biggest fan of of slapstick comedies. There is some some I like. I'm I'm not completely against slapstick, but to me the to me slapstick is kind of a it, it's a combination of of different factors. You need kind of the surroundings. You also need you you need surroundings. You need slapstick. You also need kind of a another comedic element on top of the slapstick. You usually to me it you need at least some clever some clever dialogue, some clever wordplay. And if you don't have those, like, if you don't have the surroundings and the wordplay, if you simply have slapstick, in, in most of the cases, the slapstick doesn't do anything for me. You need live and let die boat chase to make the slapstick work. I, I kind of <laughs> need, like, to give some examples where I, the slapstick has worked for me. That there was the animal house. Which had had the college college surrounding in it, and there was some wordplay, and that I found relatively funny. And also some some of the police squad, but the, well, the, some of the police squad episodes, the Naked Gun series, and and some of these kind kind of a late eighties American slapstick movies. There are, there are few that actually work with me, but. In general, I would say that slapstick is not really my cup of tea. Yeah, also to be completely honest, I was waiting for a long time to get to the funny parts, but there is something, but maybe we have lost something in the translation here, because this is coming from a little bit of a different culture, but let's see how Matt feels about these comedic sequences. What do you think? So, as a child, I found this entire piece hilarious. As an adult, the, the the part where he's driving down the road and he's going through the gates and he's got uh, got to open the gates and close the gates, but but, uh, but the car doesn't have any brakes and so he's using the the stones and, and, and stuff. That that I found amusing and I, I found to actually be a, a fairly decent use of of the speed the the sped up footage. But the the yeah. whole can't talk to women trope. I, I I'm not sure if this is. You know, as an adult, I I I, I now th- just find that trope really boring, or if it's that that the sort of the cultures moved on. But I mostly just found it cringy at this point. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, to to me, the kind of the biggest problem with the humor of the film is that you 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 can bet that if there is a setup which could lead into a, a, some kind of a joke, you can be damn sure that. The film will play that joke. Like if, if there, if there is, if if there is a moment where the character could fall over. To, to give give the example, when the car gets stuck in the mud in the middle of a river and the man starts to carry a gate to the opposite end, that that is, that is a situation you can kind of see that there is a possibility that Andrew will fall over, and and Kate will get trenched because of that. And by God, does that if that precise moment does actually appear in the film? Yeah, yeah. So, so that one actually is, is a really good good example uh, of a, a thing that's that's in South African hu- uh, humor that I'm not really sure where it, uh, it, it comes from, but I, I I feel like there are much better instances of it. But that is, you know, you know that the funny thing is going to happen. 
but it's going to delay that uh, that uh, that that funny thing fr fr from happening for as long as, uh, as as possible, so that you almost feel uncomfortable waiting for it to happen because you know it has to happen. That that that's a a, mm. a, a fairly common trope in, in like uh, South African TV and and, and stuff as well that does not seem to to tr uh, translate to, to other cultures even ve uh, very closely re related cultures like uh, like Mo Monty Python has a little bit of that but uh, but South African co uh, comedy has a lot of that and the com combined with with that not being the best spot to, to use the, that trope it's, it's sort of a little bit overplayed yeah I was a little bit perplexed when I read some reviews and there were people who a lot of people who were writing that this is the funniest film of their lives and that some people were actually so so entertained by it but that they would be laughing throughout the film pretty much and they would have tears in their eyes most of the time so i kept wondering if i had like lost something very crucial here or maybe i just don't have the sense of humor <laughs> There are a few things that that get lost in tra in translation. When it was originally released, and and honestly, when when it still gets played in in South Africa, that there are portions of it that are in Afrikaans that get, uh, get dubbed into into English for uh, for the international release, and that that yeah. does butcher uh, some so, some of the jokes. But yeah, th this was obviously not a a language ba uh, barrier there. There, there. there were a couple of ex of examples of of jokes that w when I watched it this time in in pure English did not quite land the same way they uh, they do with the Afrikaans. Another thing that might might also come into play here with me and Kari is that we are kind of a we came into contact with this film when we were too old. And the, the kind of the sociological surroundings surrounding us, the two of us, they were wrong for for us really to get in with the film. Because like Kari, I also found many testaments that this really is really funny film, and and a lot of stories from people who say who say that this is one of their favorite comedies. And the most interesting one for me personally was was coming from from a person who had seen the film in very young age while living in Soviet Russia. This this being something that the film being something that was really not you were not supposed to see this in in inside Soviet Union. This Soviet Union was very tenaciously so supported the anti-apartheid struggle. And because of this, they had implemented the cultural boycott of South Africa. This being South African film, of course, meant that, well, the officials of, of Soviet Union were kind of banning it outright. A lot of the, the cinema culture of, of so Soviet Union was built around illegally smuggled v VHSs that were brought into Soviet Union and then secretly dubbed inside Soviet Union and then played in these underground movie clubs, kind of a movie parlors. And this is kind of where, where, the, where this person had come in contact with, with the cards must be crazy originally. And there is something like, there is something that me and Kari here are most definitely missing. We, we are 30 something old when we now for the first time see the film and we don't have any kind of we don't have this oh it's a it's a it's a band gem that we we have to go into this underground to to actually witness it and the government will, don't want us to see it to to us this is simply this is something that you can simply buy on amazon and nobody will care nobody will try to prevent you from seeing it and we are not even that young. I, I I think a lot of that is that the the culture has moved on, and so things uh, things that were hilarious at, at that point are now just cringy. Most likely, most likely, it's been like forty years now since this was yeah. put out. So, so the sen sense of humor has, or the the people's expectations have changed. People have grown a bit tired, or they have seen enough of this type of jokes in the eighties and nineties. 
or even 70s. And then again, I'm I'm not also I'm not saying that this is completely without laughs. No, there, there are moments that I do genuinely find funny. In, in the film, they, they just are got these lesser moments. Yeah. To give you an example, in in the scene, the next scene or the scene next to that, there is the moment when when Andrew tries to winch the car out of the mud. He uses the winch, uh, ties it around the tree, the winch t- around the tree and starts the winch. Uh, unfortunately, Kate, Kate gets stuck in a tree. Andrew has to help help her out. The winds is still going on, and eventually, somehow the winds manages to be strong enough that it will actually pull the car up in the air and get it stuck in the tree. And at, at some point, Ambody comes to check out the proceedings and asks, like, wh- from Andrew, where is the car? And Andrew makes this kind of embarrassed, apologetic face and points up in the air to show, so guess that, yeah, I got the sca- car stuck in the tree. And that moment, like that, that facial expression was something that I really did enjoy. Okay, I didn't really laugh at that moment, but there is the scene where they're trying to get the gate opened once again now with the girl, and the girl gets tired of this and says that, I'm getting out, this is too weird. <laughs> <laughs> it truly was. And that's kind of an interesting and, and weird notion on, on what are the stuff that you and me actually laughed about <laughs> in, in in this film because it's like most of the big comedic set pieces are, are something that really did not have effect on me. Andrew trying to carry Kate over the river did nothing for me. The whole winch thing as a as a comedic set piece did not work for me. Uh, Kate getting stuck in uh, on that tree branch did not nothing for me. It, it was this really small, kind of a off-handed throwaway moments, which I found funny. Don't get me wrong, I somehow I didn't find the whole gate gag in itself funny, but I found this piece of dialogue at that moment really funny. <laughs> so, uh, uh, so the the winch piece again is what is one of those scenes where you know what's coming. You you. He's he's winching, winching the car out, and, and you can just see oh the the thing that's that that's going to happen is is that what he's doing to fix the car is somehow going to make the, the situation worse. So it, it's again that that's uh, that same sort of trope in South African comedy. The gate one, I think that 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 is something that most South Africans have had to deal with. You you're on on this uh, little road and and and. Uh, stuff's fenced off to to protect certain a- a areas from wildlife or 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 just to stop people from going too fast so they've got got gates or or just to mark off this is my land and, and this uh, you know this road is a public throughway but don't but but don't leave the road and so there, there are just parts of the country where you're you're stopping every five minutes and you're Opening the gate, and you're driving through, and you're closing the gate, and then you're driving for oh, five minutes, yeah. and then and, and and so the gate uh, uh, piece it's, it, it itself adds to oh how how bad could the, the, this car be, and that and that is a cultural thing that I've 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 never really seen that 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 sort of gates all across all across the uh, the road everywhere you go elsewhere where I've traveled so. so it pro it probably gets a little bit lost in there for you. Okay, that makes a lot lot more sense because this Mr. Stain is 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 coming or he is living in this culture where you have a lot of these gates and then you introduce somebody who completely knows nothing about the culture, just comes there to teach school children, and this is completely new concept for her that the, these are always on the way. And yeah, that, that is way more funnier to think about it like that. And then there is some more funny scenes, like the Mr. Stain is trying to make some coffee, apparently, but he's kind of dancing around, steps on the coals accidentally. This has kind of nothing to do, I guess, with the with the fancying the lady, but uh, steps on coals, and then uh, Kate makes the notion that, what are you doing? Making coffee. <laughs> and it's, I think, these facial expressions that make the scene. Sad Prince Lou is doing pretty priceless uh, faces throughout this film. Yeah, I, I think both both of the uh, those two are 
great A actors that uh, that they do re uh, really well, especially with the more subtle facial expressions. And I think if the, uh, if the movie itself were, were more low key comedy and 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 less of the really obvious setup, it would it would have aged a whole lot better and and yeah. quite frankly uh, uh been been better for uh, for adult audience true true then again it it was really good for audience uh, adult audiences back on its day you you really con condemned the film simply by the fact that me and Kari, who are two jaded film critics <laughs> you don't don't find it that funny yeah yeah there was actually one review that said that she was completely convinced that this was targeted for children first and foremost as far as far as i'm aware it was now my my parents also found uh, uh found it funny they were fully grown adults and everything but uh, by the time it, it, it came out but and my 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 mom in particular uh, did did find it hilarious but uh but i i think that that, that uh, the, the the sort of big comedy pe pieces with with that big setup is more targeted at, at children and and then the little comedy and some of the puns including unfortunately a couple of the uh, the puns that are lost in tra in translation are more targeted at, at the adults yeah just to get back to the dubbing here a little bit because this has been really dubbed a lot it seems for example the version that i have has this you know international audience dubbing so I understand the Afrikaans was uh, dubbed into English, and and uh, yeah, there is there is not only that. There is the fact that also was it in the original version that uh, Kate Thompson's voice, Prince Lou's voice, was actually she was speaking English, but she was speaking the American accent with such of a heavy accent of her own that they had to dub her. Yeah, I I I don't know why they chose to uh, to make Kate Thompson American because I don't feel like it added anything to to the scene. They could just as easily have made her a character from Johannesburg or Cape Town who, who's you know never really gone into uh, in, into the wild and super easy, easily without losing anything. I, and I, f I felt like what what they did there. J that, 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 <laughs> That's actually one of the, the the things that sort of took me out of the of the film is why why does she have an American accent? Why does she need to be American? And also, why is her American accent so sort of dreadful? Which I mean, the answer to that is, uh, is English is her, uh, is, uh, is her second language, and for uh, and for so, for someone who uh, who's speaking in 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 their second language, she still made a good effort for for it, but it didn't really add much to the movie in my, in my opinion and might have taken stuff away from it something right. it might have add well would, could have been the international reach of the film because have, having an american a character and that american character being the one who travels to south, uh, south africa and kind of has to experience all, all the weirdness yeah, well well to american and western audiences all together American character is someone who is easy to use to build your film around of. Right? That was also the kind of a go-to notion, for example, Romancing of the Stone, the adventure comedy film from around the same time period. That was from 84. Or even the original Crocodile Dundee film, which also came from the 80s and also has the exact same kind of conceit. Uh, American jaded corporate lady traveling into, in, the, in that film's case, into the mysterious Australia. Uh, true, uh, true. Okay, I... In that film, wasn't it kind of played like that, that this is now the kind of a stereotypical film, a stupid American appearing in Australia, but here it's not played out with the, like, intelligence. Because supposedly... Well, there's a lot of characters from the 80s films that try to make it somehow funny that, that this ignorant city girl, for example, coming from America is kind of the stupid person. And it's funny because there is some smart Australian person as a juxtaposition to that. Whereas yeah, here, that, that, here it's not the case. The actual the local person is a little bit goofy. That actually is a good point. 
I suppose yeah. she, uh, she, she may be more of a, an proxy for the audience. So that would make sense as why it was something that it was entirely unnecessary for me, but may have helped with, uh, with its international uh, recognition because now you, uh, you have someone that the audience is more used to um, empathizing with and, and understanding, whereas for, yeah. uh, for me it was unnecessary. It, it also could have also helped the international audiences to understand kind of the contradiction between her character and, well, the African characters of the film. Most most notably the contradiction between her and Key. Because once again, I, I don't know how well it would have translated for the Western audiences to, to use Johannesburg as, as the capitalistic empire where everybody has to live up with the clock and... It's a, it's nothing like Key's world, but everybody in the West can very easily understand that America is is corporate driven clock society. <laughs> yeah, I, so so yes and no because in in the beginning where uh, where they've got like the the different parts of the world and they're zooming around on 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 the map, they do use Johannesburg and that that's that's the city skyline that you, that that you see there and, and everything as sort of that city but then they have uh kate thompson, kate thompson be sort of maybe american and so i maybe they're just using it as a as a quick jump in for that but if they are trying to do that that might be a little bit of a hole in in, in the movie it didn't that part didn't bother me that they're you know displaying Johannesburg, and you know they've they've got the they've got the the, the lady driving twenty meters down down the road to the post box, and then back to uh, back to her driveway within that 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 character. But maybe that that then should have been tweaked. I'm 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 not sure. I'm not not sure if it was ne- would have been necessary to tweak that. But now when when you're sort of analyzing that, that seems like there might be a little bit of a hole in there. Yeah, very good. So key meets the so-called gods and tries to give the battle back, but it doesn't work. Now Boga's troops continue the escape. There's just a car shown really quickly continuing the drive. And, and then Kalahari Desert is shown. They're messing with the car with Mbudi. Mbudi is trying to keep it connected to the car and drive it out because the car is malfunctioning. And then the Stain visits the school of Kate Thompson and messes up everything. And... That was truly chaotic. I don't know, Henrik, did you laugh? Uh, once again, unfortunately, no. Yeah. I I really well, I, I did clearly see what they were going for with that and what the joke was. I, I did understand very well what I was supposed to be laughing at, but I didn't even chuckle. Yeah, as a, as a kid, this was probably the, uh, uh, the funniest scene. <laughs> uh, yeah. because it it was sort of an imagination of oh man imagine you've got this teacher and then this this strange man come, comes in and makes a fool of himself right. wouldn't that be a wonderful breakup of, of 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 the class as an adult there were some it 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 was still chuckle worthy and then it was cringy in a way that uh, that that made me giggle a little bit about, about, about how cringy it was. But uh, but I didn't find it as funny as I used to. Yeah, like, it was really long. I mean, in the sense that they were continuing to make him do stupid things, uh, dropping stuff. And I think if they would have carried it a little bit long to make it even more absurd, maybe that could have been even funnier. I don't know. Henrik, do, Henrik might know some scenes where they drive with this trope even further and make it completely abysmal. <laughs> in, gen- in general, some, ti- some type of a similar slapstick moment that goes like for, I don't know, 20, 10 minutes. Uh, somewhere I, I felt that where, where it has worked, for example, would be something like an animal house or other slapstick comedies where, where they take the joke into such a length that that the fumbling idiot starts to actually cause serious property damage through through his antics. That, that is yeah. something that, for example, does not happen in the in the school she, scene of of this film. The the, the, the fumbling around part, the, the scene takes its time. It it goes relatively long, but the school itself actually doesn't suffer any damage 
damage to do due to his due to what happens due to chaos. Yeah, it probably would have been genuinely funny if Mr. Stain would have completely destroyed the entire schoolhouse and everybody would have run for their lives. That the complete destruction of the building would have been imminent. Or, or e- even at least a- at least some destruction of the building that might have actually helped the scene. It, it would yeah. have kind of driven the chaos e- even more forward. It would have been more total. Right, maybe in Gods Must Be Crazy too, where they had the bigger budget. <laughs> All right, so Key shoots one of the farm goats and gets arrested and shot, and that's not something that we return to in any way in any of the next scenes, but yeah, there is also the overdub of the clicking sounds that is really clear to me, and it was a little bit distracting. Yeah, that... so, so this part I, I didn't... Re- uh... Uh, the, 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 about the clicking sounds, I didn't really understand whether cause it, it's it, it felt like in in some of the scenes, uh, like he is cl- uh, clearly actually clicking it, and it may have just been like no one knew really how to record uh, record stuff with click consonants, and so it sounded awkward. But in some of the, in, in some of the other places, it's, it it sounded like the the guys just speaking Swano or something, and then they and then they're dubbing some clicks over it to make it sound like he, like he's speaking another language. Yeah, <laughs> and that's also my take on on the dubbed added clicking sounds in in the film. I I did feel very strongly that that was done on purpose to make the film feel for feel more exotic to the Western audience. To, to make the language even more kind of alien for me and Kari and, and American audiences. Way too much audio tampering in this film, at least in my version. Yeah, the, the, there were also some cases where I was pretty sure that uh, the people weren't any, saying anything that made sense. They were ju- uh, just saying tongue twisters. <laughs> and the, uh, and then they would, uh, and then in some cases they'd, they'd say a tongue twister and, uh, uh, and overdub some clicks. And there were a couple of cases with Mpudi's character where you could tell by the shape of his mouth that he was doing nothing at all that re- uh, that resembled a click in the entire sentence. And yet, just, you know, click, 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 click all uh, all, all all the way through, just, just dubbed over what he was saying. Mpudi as a character maybe was the the biggest example of this. Yeah. Yeah, I I, I don't believe that either uh, Michael Tace or Friedman, whose voice was dubbed, could speak any sort of click consonants. I think that they just had him read off some some sort of either a Bantu language or some Bantu sounding gibberish and then dubbed over it with clicks to make it, a, 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 it sound like a sound language, which of course is unrelated to the Bantu languages. So it, it, again, not not something I noticed as, as, as a child, not something I, ca- I cared about, but but something that was really obvious when I was watching it th- uh, this week. <laughs> and also something that m- might uh, explain some of the modern backlash the film today receives. Yeah, interestingly, Stain now wants a key out of prison, and they get him out. Did somebody actually notice why? Stain is so adamant to get him out of the prison. So um, th- this is so, sort of gl- uh, glossed over, but Stain is sort of playing in in in, in a bit the role of the, like the, the South African white liberal or white or white progressive at, un, under the apartheid go- uh, uh, government. So this the same thing of him being arrested by the Botswana government and 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 convicted of, of killing that, that goat. It is sort of analogized to you know Europeans coming into South Africa and setting up this entirely separate governmental system that no one there un- un- understands with entirely different base fundamental I- I- ide- ideas about uh, about the world and then expecting the, uh, them to cope with it and so he, he's sort of been being placed as, as that and uh, honestly there, there, there were a, a bunch of, of scenes that they could have shortened or just got rid of the, uh, the comedy por- portions in, in those scenes and taken the piece where Mpudi and, S- and Stain are chatting with, with each other about that and sort of expanded more uh, more on it. But 
to, at, at the risk of uh, starting to sound preachy. So. <laughs> All right, and uh, so they get key out, but there's a bit of a lion attack, so things go wrong all the time. Meanwhile, Boha takes hostages from the school, and uh, then there is a scene where Key is taught to dr- how to drive, but it doesn't work really that well when we get to the last scenes. I think what you're seeing in 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 the village there is the government clearing out the people, so uh, because the village is uh, is on their path from the school to Mozambique. And there is one small scene where. There are some people on the road, and the police is asking for directions where Boha's gang went. And then he's like, "You turn right at the oh uh, hell, I'll show you." Oh, that that was that was looking for Stain because so so um oh, yeah the uh yeah the, the the guy with that sort of van with the shade uh with, with with the shaded uh lid he's he seems to have uh to be. A, a combination of like a tour guide for safari tours and the head of a hunting lodge. I'm not really sure what uh, what he did. Maybe his lodge does both or, or or something. But so he knows he knows the area as uh, almost as well as Stain does. And so that uh, and and so they sort of know each other and they're on on honestly what they're, they're sort of the on, the the only white people in the in, in the area and so, and so there would be this whole they talk to each other a lot because uh, because every, everyone else is speaking Twana or uh, or Koi Koi or or, or uh, another language that they won't, wouldn't understand so so they they're using his local knowledge to to get to Stain yeah he's uh, Mr Stain is on some kind of a dung expedition or what seems like it and they're looking with the like this telescope at oh they they're doing a, a um a census of the, of the animals in the region they're counting the uh, uh the, the wildlife the, <laughs> okay. uh, the, yeah so this the... this is something that happens actually on an annual basis th- uh, throughout much uh, uh, of, of the area so that they know how many zebra there are how many ostriches etc et for wildlife maintenance okay okay well stain then notices that there are prisoners on this little expedition, and then Aboha gets agitated with the group and advises one of the prisoners to go report that now food is needed every ten miles on the trip that they are they are taking. And Ki infiltrates this prison base and tranquilizes the baddies, except two guys. So there's a little bit of a fight that Stain gets to do. And uh, actually, well, sometimes people talk that this is the accomplishment of Stain, but it's pretty much the accomplishments of Key that are at play here. Oh yeah, it's one hundred percent. He, uh, yeah. yes, I think that's that that that's something that sort of makes this movie a little bit more progressive than it would uh, would otherwise be. Is recognizing that all of this is things that things that he built. To, put together and basically Stain is, is almost just like the provider of technology for me to rescue these kids. Yeah, that's right. Any thoughts about this kind of a final final scene where they get rid of the, the buddies? Henrik? I actually, to, to me this was one of the, of the final fight is, is one of the highlight scenes yeah. of, of the film. Yeah. It- so, surprised to say, I, I mean, I, I know this is I do know that this is supposed to be a funny comedy for the whole family, and with, with that mindset, it's kind of a weird that there are these scenes of horrible violence, but I kind of was most on board with, with the horrible violence on the film. I also did like the fact that, that Stain, as a character, was able to use his knowledge of biology to kind of help him out in the shootout with the two remaining guards. So I don't think that was Stain's knowledge of of, of biology. I think that uh, was again key. Because if you remember back to the the very beginning, uh, where they talk, uh, where they they show the guy shooting the the little antelope. There's a uh, a, t- a type of beetle that that grows in in the Cal- uh, Kalahari. Uh, that uh, the, the 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 sand people and and all people sort of classified as 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 bushmen, they would uh, grind up the larvae, I, I believe, and they would 
put, uh, put the tip of the arrow with, with that. And the, the larvae have this toxin in them that if it gets into your bloodstream, I'm not sure if it's an anesthetic or if it's a, uh, uh, actually po uh, highly poisonous, but you can eat it and, uh, and whatever your stomach does ne neutralizes it. Uh, literally, I, I, I looked it up because I, I, all, I, I, all I ever knew it as was uh, Bushman arrow poison beetle, and that's literally the English name for it is the Bushman arrow poison beetle. Uh, fun fact, first European to, uh, to describe them was a Finnish guy, so connection to Finland there for you guys. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yeah, I, I, I happened to see that when when I was looking up the uh, the, uh, the 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 name, and, and I was like, oh, huh, look at look at that connection. Um, but so they're using that that same poison for, uh, uh, for, from the arrows to sedate them uh, the, uh, their men. And so uh, and so what, one, once once again, all 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 that Andrew is is providing is the uh, the needle and the uh, the smaller bow. But there is this shootout that happens between yes. the last two bad guys, and there is this scene where where Stain, both Stain and and the bad guy are covering behind the rocks, and Stain notices that there's some kind of a tree that reaches over the bad guy's location, and he shoots the tree, and some some kind of a white liquid comes yeah, out, a, a... out of the tree. He drops on on the bad guy, and that causes some kind of a I guess burning sensation. Which yeah, so it, it's a hoodier plant. Okay. So it, it, it yeah, it, it, it looks like a, it looks like a cactus, and if, you, if you'll notice, like the, the specific piece that he that he shoots is like this very succulent plant. It's not actually a cactus, but uh, but uh, but a lot of people just see, oh, this this is a cactus. Um, but it's sometimes you uh, used uh, as an appetite suppressant. But it does, uh, if, if, if you uh, touch it, it, it does cause some irritation and rashes on, on, on the skin. Not nearly to the extent shown in, in, uh, in, in the movie. Or not if you touch it, if you get the, uh, the sort of liquid on, uh, on the inside, the actual, actual succulent juices. If, it, if you get that on, on your skin, it can, it can cause irritation. And so that's what it's, it's sort of an extreme version of that. Okay. When it comes to the children's reactions regarding this film, I was able to find something regarding that as well. As pointed out, there are kind of semi-horrific scenes of violence where a child is trying to shoot the baddies at the end of the film with a gun, and I was expecting this to go completely wrong. There is the scene where the Bohas groups get into the government, government house, and uh, while it's played kind of slapsticky, it's still pretty violent stuff. And... There is actually a website that lists specifically the the opinions of the parents regarding films' violence and how suitable they are for children. And one writer said that, quote, My 10-year-old son seemed intrigued by the breasts of the African tribeswoman, but the terrorist shooting up people brought him to tears. My bad, end quote. Wow, that's kind of a strong reaction. But, yeah... Be vigilant, parents. Then again, it it bears to to take note that even though that the film does have its share of deaths, like people do actually die as a result of the shootouts in in the film. In the kind of first third of the film, where there's the assassination and later on on the helicopter raid on the bad guys' hideout, both which do e end up in casualties, but all the deaths are less. That's true. Yeah, it's, it, it's it's sort of a live action version of cartoon violence, if uh, if, if you will. It's kind of, kind of. And the film ends with the scene where Mister Stain goes to Thompson, and somehow it seems that she is ready for some kind of a relationship with this bumbling biologist after all, because that is very attractive. We, which is an ending that comes completely out of left field and made no sense whatsoever. Kinda, but then again it's built up a little bit in the school where she gives this little smile. No, it's smile. not. Well, in the sense that there's the smile at least, not this complete it, confusion of thumbs on like, what the hell is going on? It, 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 it's not built up at the least. Like, this is, this is kind of a moment where, where if you analyze the film, you can see the mechanical components 
Like you can you can see the scenes that in other movies would have somehow used to build up that ro- romantic relationship, but this film does not use them. And i- if it does, it then underplays those se- moments and those components in a way that they don't actually help Stain as a character in any way appear in any way more positive light to Kate. This would have been helped if in the final battle, let's say, Kate Thompson would have noticed that the, it is Mr. Stain helping them out in that moment. But there's not even that, is there? No, there, there is not. The the actual credit for... Uh, even though Stain and Key are... And, and Buddy. The, that trio is, is the one who actually deal with the hostage situation and take out the baddies. But the one who actually takes the credit, the one who Kate Thompson sees as the one who who most likely dealt with the situation, once again was Jack Hine, the other yeah. white dude of the film. And that kind of st- ties into all of those scenes which which Stain and Thompson had shared throughout the film, which all of them, all of them, every single one of them, paint Stain in a bad light. There, there is the, the first, I'm going to get Thompson and bring her to the village, hijinks, in which Stain appears, well, rapist at, at worst. Like, there, there are moments where Thompson is, is seriously... Seriously believes that Stain is trying to sexually assault her, and then there is the school scene in which Stain simply comes off as a as a bumbling idiot, and then there is the final confrontation between Stay, Ambuli, and Key when they take out the bad guys, and Jack Hunt takes all the credit. Yeah, it's really only an interesting psychological phenomenon. <laughs> yeah, it's 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 a happy ending that is not being built up on any way from character perspective and which make no sense. Surprisingly, in the movie's case, this is one of those rare cases where actually the public and the creme de la creme critics think that this is actually a good film and they have, if you look at the Rotten Tomatoes, well, I don't know how much you personally, dear listener, read into it, but nevertheless, it shows the similar kind of percentage of appreciation for this film, around the 85 mark. Yeah, so Wikipedia actually uh, 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 said it had a 95% uh, percent fresh score on, on Rotten Tomatoes, but when you go there, it's, uh, it says 85% for, uh, for the tomato meter and, for, and 84% for, uh, for audience score. I, I yeah. did some digging. It used to say higher than it uh, than it does now. I'm not sure why I didn't get, dig in any, any further, but uh, but uh, but it did actually used to be a 95 percent and went and went down to an 85 percent. So, right. Uh, which again could could be you know new new reviews as as, as the culture has ch- uh, changed and and then it's it, it, it's also while while it. It, it was clearly controversial because it also got nominations for uh, for some awards for just how terrible the, uh, it, it was and you know terrible film or, uh, awards and stuff like that. Yeah, yeah, it uh, was something aching to the Razzie Award, not the Razzie Award, but something was. It was nominated for something like this. Yeah. The New York Times wrote a pretty interesting article, a review about the film with many great quotes. I don't know if we have time for everything, but. They were talking about whether it's racist and whether there is incorrect and facetious depiction of aboriginals, whether it ignores the apartheid and if that has and what to think about that generally. Also, quote, it's just possible that this is the way Mr. Ace would characterize the attitude of many of South Africa's more enlightened white citizens who may be troubled by the system, but incapable of taking any effective stand against it. I don't want to think about it. It runs through the film like a musical theme, end quote. So the writer is referring to the I don't want to think about it that it says said quite a bit throughout the film. I think that's sticking a little bit too deep into the film, but that's just me. So I, I can I can see that and it it definitely it it, it the, the the film definitely did gloss over some things that uh, that 
a South African audience would sort of know a, a, a little bit more. But I think this is, I, I think that uh, that quote is the, the New York Times really tr uh, uh, trying to dig and, and sounding like a uh, high school English teacher while they do it. Kind of, yeah, that's that's what it felt like. There was also something that an IMDb reviewer actually wrote. It was a really well-written review for the film. So, quote, The common thread throughout is a very tongue-in-cheek critique in the mode of a parable of both culture, society, civilization, and views about the culture and society, civilization, including politics, religion, mores, and so on. And do not let the ridiculous, negative, ideological criticism dissuade you. This is a classic, a masterpiece, that presents both surface entertainment and a complex, deep, quotation marks, themes and subtexts. If you haven't seen it yet, you must, end quote. Hmm. I think some people see way too many layers here than they intended. Maybe. As, as an adult, I did see layers that I was missing as, uh, as a child that were sort of more serious uh, layers. For example, um, go, uh, going back to that goat scene, it, it was sort of an, an opportunity for, uh, for the audience to see something that is very clearly a crime from, uh, from, from a perspective of, of someone who doesn't understand how it could possibly be a crime. Because how can you own an animal? You know, it's its, a, it's, its own thing. Yeah. And, and so it allows you to empathize with, with, with someone who the, uh, the audience probably would never have empathized uh, with before or even really thought of previously. But then I feel like a, a, a lot of people take their own, oh, well, here's how I empathize with, with, with that person and say that the movie's trying to say that when the movie is just trying to let you think about how the, uh, how the world looks from this guy's perspective. Is it, does that make sense? Yeah, it made sense. Did you feel also that the film did it right, that it was ignoring possible racial tensions? It depicts the whites and the blacks were very equal in the film, which might have not been the case still in the 1980s in South Africa that much. Whichever the case, I feel that it's 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 fine. Like, it's something that necessarily doesn't belong into the world of the film, so they're just leaving it out, and that makes sense uh, to me. Yeah, I, I feel like that was a very intentional decision. Yeah. And uh, it, it I think it was done because... In in the in this movie, if if you had depicted it with racial tensions and, and, and stuff, the quote unquote bad guys would have whichever decision you, you made, whether you you think of like oh the government is the bad guys, well that that would probably have been a white government, or the gorillas is the bad guys, that would probably have have been been a black, uh, black government. Both of those would have been making a political statement that I think the film didn't want to make. Yeah. Where, where, whereas if if you the 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 way it does it, it just sort of ignores race. It, uh, it's it says this this movie. It, it it's like shouting at the audience. This movie is not about race, and so it it very intentionally ma makes choices in order to make the movie not about race. Yeah, sounds good to me. Henrik, would you like to lead us in the quickies? Well, why not? If if we take a look at the quickie list, I, I guess the first question is, what was your guy's favorite performance here tonight? I listed Sandra Prinsloo as Kate Thompson, because you can read the emotions that uh, she conveys very well, and I felt that the performance was quite natural, uh, so it was easy to read her and... Uh, I felt that there was a lot of com comedic effect in in those eyes. I I have the same reasons to choose oh. Michael Thys, who played Ampudi in in the film. I I have ba basically uh, everything you said on Thompson Carvey is is my take on Ampudi. Um, on top of that, I also like the fact that Ampudi is kind of the most uh, that the character who most kind of a place in or draws parallels between and draws the, the different plot lines together, since he is the character who works as an interpreter between Key and, well, the rest of the, the cast of the film. Interesting. I didn't really pay much attention to this character and felt that it, it was not one of the key characters or any, not even one of the inter most interesting characters to follow here. 
Yeah, to me, Mpudi was uh, glue for the film. The, the the film would have uh, fallen apart with, uh, w- w- without him or not been able to uh, 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 to, to exist. Mm. But as a character, he didn't really do much, if that makes sense. Yeah. My, my favorite performance, uh, honestly, was, uh, I'm going to butcher the name again, Nkau uh, as Pri. Uh-huh. And it's, it's not because I think it was the best acted performance. But because it it felt so genuine, and uh, honestly, probably because a lot of his confusion and stuff was pretty genuine. But uh, I, I I felt like he managed to take a a, a a character that maybe wasn't really intended as anything other other than the noble noble savage trope, and make me connect with him more than uh, than I thought I would. Yeah, all the credit in the world for him and for appearing in this film like such of a big pro- thing for must have been for him to come into the spotlight like that and the world of film so with that out of the way what was your favorite scenes yeah <laughs> this was really hard well to me it's that moment when Ampuri when Stain points to Ampuri that that Antichrist the chief is is in the tree Maybe for me it would be then the nightly scene with the rhinoceros that is just stomping out the fire and the whole story of rhinos having this these antics of stomping out the, out the fire. I felt that I was really getting into the movie at that, that point, but yeah, then joke-wise I didn't feel that it was going like into a better place. So so for me it was uh, the scene where Mpudi is teaching me how to drive. Not the the follow up uh, where where he's now driving the uh, the car in, in, in reverse and so, uh, and so just just the the the, the scene where, uh, where where he's there and he's yelling clutch and brake at at all of that it reminded me of of when my dad was t- uh, teaching me to uh, to drive and I, w- I was you know stalling the car every thirty se- uh, 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 seconds and. So, so it, it it helped me sort of connect with with, with both characters in a, in addition to at least for me being absolutely hilarious. <laughs> well, Corey here thought that that favorite scene was a tough question, but oh boy, what, was he e- ever wrong here? Because well, tough, toughness comes here in this extremely quotable movie. What was your guy's favorite quotes? This wasn't actually that tough. Uh, this would be from the beginning of the film. It's a little bit long, but let's go anyway. So it's coming from the narrator. Only 600 miles to the south, there's a vast city, and here you find civilized man. Civilized man refused to adapt himself to his environment. Instead, he adapted his environment to suit him. So he built cities, roads, vehicles, machinery, and he put power lines to run his labor-saving devices. But somehow he didn't know where to stop. The more he improved his surroundings to make life easier, the more complicated he made it. So now his children are sentenced to 10-15 years of school just to learn how to survive in this complex and hazardous habitat they were born into. And civilized man who refused to adapt to his surroundings now finds he has to adapt and readapt every hour of the day to his self-created environment. For instance, if it's Monday and 7.30 comes up, you have to disadapt from your domestic surroundings and readapt yourself to an entirely different environment. 8 o'clock means everybody has to look busy. Then 30 means you can stop looking busy for 15 minutes. And then you have to look busy again. And so your day is chopped into pieces and each segment of time you adapt to a new set of circumstances. No wonder some people go off the rails a bit. Well, I, I guess that would, was kind of the only easy one to pick, for, pick from this film. Was that yours? That actually wasn't mine. My, mine is an, an honest God quote and, and not a goddamn litany of wall text here. <laughs> uh, I, I, I have the moment when Ambudi is basically explaining away the entire female gender. I know how to marry them. Nobody knows how to live with them. Mm. Matt? Um, so so I, I, I kept flip-flopping between, between two. One of them uh, was I actually wasn't even going to mention, except for for the fact that uh, for the quote that uh, that you chose, 
because later on in that same narration uh, scene, the narrator is talking about the uh, the Coke bottle and calls it a real labor saving device. <laughs> and so I, I I thought that that was a fantastic connection. It, you know, it it required tons of context though. But but the the, the piece that uh, that is sort of more appropriate is the piece where Stan and Mpudi are, are, are speaking to each other, and Stan is, is saying, "I need to go and talk to Miss Thompson," and I'll t- uh, 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 say, "Look, Miss Thompson, I know uh, I know you think I'm an idiot, but normally I'm quite normal. It's only when I'm the, in the presence of a lady that I. It's just it's really just an interesting psychological phenomenon." If a man who's susceptible to the type of parafreudian syndrome like this occurs, encounters a nubile female, what happens? And Mpudi <laughs> says, I suppose another big word happens. Then Stan says, <laughs> too, too erudite? And just the, the too erudite? With, 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 with how, he, how he's try, desperately trying to ex- explain how he's absolutely clumsy and all thumbs cannot do a thing right. And then he's doing it using all of this, you know, high level academic language yeah. w- w- was a, 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 a wonderful juxtaposition for me. Yeah, that was pretty funny, I have to say. That was. I, I also hugely enjoyed that, especially Ampudi's comment. Uh, and I, I guess another big word will happen. Yeah. <laughs> yes. That was, once again, that was one of those really small moments, kind of a throwaway moment of the film, which I did find extremely hilarious. Yeah, ex- exactly. And I think that's that's the much better portion of the uh, uh, of the uh, the comedy and the, and the portion of the comedy in the in the film that re- that really does stand the test of time. Whilst while some of it is sort of not as it's faded away at, uh, as movie viewers have become more sophisticated in what they're looking for. I, yeah. I don't know about more sophisticated, but I personally might have become more jaded and more cynical. <laughs> so in in that that sense, the the slapstick universe of the film might be a bit bit kind of a too much for me these days. So something that I no longer can longer can connect fully. But I I did appreciate a lot of these small throwaway lines, small small, small appearances on people's faces. And Henrik truly is a big big cin- cinephile of this podcast. And I don't know, one, wonder if you ever or do you keep some kind of a list of the films that you watch, and do you have any statistics of what, how many films you have gone through on this earth? Actually, no. Not, not, I've never even considered that until like. Three seconds ago when you mentioned it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, maybe you should start pulling a list on IMDb. <laughs> that is the easiest I, way. The, the idea about the list does somewhat intrigue me. The idea about IMDb, not the least. Yeah, it's a text file. <laughs> maybe a text va- file. But text files are out of the way. In, in, in a film that stems from the apartheid era, what were your list up your favorite kills, you horrible human tricks? <laughs> <laughs> the Coca Cola bottle for me. Uh, what, you mean when he finally throws it out, out of God's window? I, I, I guess at the end of the film, film when he throws, throws it out of the universe and the world's edge. That one. Mine is is not nearly as meta as yours. To me, it's the the entire helicopter squad that gets blown away. That's a good shot. I wonder how it was pulled off so well. To me, um, probably the uh, the the best kill w- uh, was I think the uh, second one in the movie when he kills the uh, uh, ki- uh, kills the little antelope because I I, I know it's like. It's 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 a stretch for be, for being a, a a kill, but it gives you a little human human moment when someone is killing something, and it and it makes you feel so, uh, feel sorry not only for the animal but for the uh, but for the man who had to kill that animal. That's actually pretty goddamn good answer to this question. <laughs> <laughs> like holy, f- like like somebody has actually, honest to God, been thinking about this and and does. Does manage to find take take a quick category that does not play out well at all in in today's film 
and still ha somehow manages to find something deep in, in, in the question proposed, or the answer <laughs> he gives to that question. And if Matt is still wondering why this murderer's category is still is here, it's because we started with horror films and we thought it was really funny to keep it going. Yeah, it, it it really it it fell well with with Halloween franchise. It will work even less well in Schindler's List. <laughs> <laughs> you're you're not maybe, wrong. Maybe yeah. <laughs> maybe, maybe it's never touched that film in the <laughs> Could be for the best. <laughs> what took us out of the picture? Um, I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna give you one that probably th th this is like one percent of the film's audience uh, w would ever care. When Kate comes to the village and they sing that welcome song, they're singing Shoshalosa, which they probably only chose because there were a, a a bunch of easy to access re recordings of it, but in Botswana. That it would probably not have been a, wel uh, uh, a welcome song. It's not itself a welcome song. It's a it's an Ndebele song about um, about coming to South Africa to uh, to work on the mines, and so it it's just it, it's it's a little bit it's a little bit wrong, and and so it, I I did a double take and I was like, why are they singing Shoshalosa? There are so many perfectly reasonable uh, songs that, th that they could have used, but they just dub it over with Shoshalosa. Hmm. For me, it would be the whole joke about the car and, and the gate, even though with this newfound context to it, it is funnier, but maybe it's just it's just, it's just not working for me. <laughs> on, on my end, it, it was the hilarious... Andrew Stein, Kate Thompson comedy, especially when they are stuck on the on that river. Yeah, kind of your standard go to ha ha ha. <laughs> yeah, but now now since we have already gotten the bad out of the way, let's look at some of the goods. What put you in? Well, I'm a fan of stupid humor to an extent, so even the stupid school scene was kind of working for me. <laughs> And of course, the, the, the dialogue that you mentioned, where Mpudi and Stain, where Stain is trying to come up with the lines to tell to the lady at the very end of the film. To me, it was the opening presentation and introduction of Key and his tribe. Like, though those, those moments are somewhat problem problematic for the tropes that we have already named, but I still somehow felt, I, I felt that they were... They were warm and heartfelt, and I was with Key, the character, throughout the film, and really did enjoy that we did have the character of Key in the film. Hmm. So for me, it was definitely uh, the scene where the gorillas uh, hold up the school and, and sort of kidnap the children. It was the point where everything started coming together, and you understand what... Uh, where these plot lines are, are, are going and, and how this all connects. It, it took this sort of what al almost felt like entirely unrelated stories and started putting it uh, uh, t uh, together. And I, I feel like almost everything before that was sort of background to, uh, to the real story. And, and now fr from there to the end of the film, we actually have the story that, you, uh, that they want to tell. That's quite a lot of a lot of truth when it comes to the narrative tr structure of this film because that was something that really did bother me for the most part of, of the film was that there were three different narratives and they really didn't come together except on that final moment of, of the film. Yeah, ex exactly. I, th I think if they'd figured out a way to take the everything before that scene and put it into 15 or, tw or, or, or 20 minutes, I think the movie w uh, would have flowed a lot better. Most likely, yeah. I, I myself, I didn't find a way how to how, how the film could have salvaged the narrative structure problem I felt it had, or how it could have fixed it. But, but now that you mentioned it, if, if they would have kind of streamlined it and, and made it more tight as a package, it actually could have helped a lot here because it's it's all it's it's two thirds of the film we are following three three different plot lines 
and yeah. they don't interact. And, like... and there were there were a couple of things that they could have just probably rearranged to let, let that happen. For example, if they have the scene where uh, where they pull me out of the uh, the prison and set that after that. I'm not sure how you could rewrite it to uh, 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 to, to do that, but you you already have him and and Stand and Moody attached at, uh, as an uh, as an intertwined plotline, and so you you don't need to do that. And adding that piece doesn't, or moving it after that school scene doesn't delay the all of the plots com- uh, coming together. Whereas ki- having it before the uh, the uh, the, the the school scene it uh it doesn't make make the movie worse i just i, I just think pu- uh putting it uh, uh that that's that's a way to have brought the, all of the plot lines earlier as if you could have moved scenes like that until after the school scene yeah that could have actually helped a lot because then kind of the, it would have it, it would have kind of a gel directly into the final confrontation and and the kind of the climatic end of the film. Like there, there would have been a, a direct path that would have kept the focus purely on on Stain, Key and Buddy and it, it would have followed that with that focus until the very end of the film. Yeah, I understand yeah. that in the sequel they break it up even more and there are like three or five distinctly kind of different storylines which also kind of are tied in together at the end anyway. I, f- I feel like in in the in the sequel the uh, storylines interact more though that okay. uh, and and that that that's what helps make it a bit better movie to me. All right, maybe I'll have to look at it one one day. But w- with that out of the way, we also kind of tackled the scissors of sacrilege in in yeah. what put, put us in section when we uh, already addressed all the kind of narrative structure problems of the film. And try to find ways of how, how to fix them. So maybe we jump that over. And we can go directly to... You really know you are watching The Guards Must Be Crazy when... Well, I, I would still say about the sacrilege that, that it's kind of a curious case that we have a... What is it, like two hour long comedy with this intertwining plot lines and... One of the leading characters, Stain, appears in the film only 27 minutes in. And there are some moments of the of the Boha group where I feel that some of those scenes feel kind of... They are kind of fl- floating there. That They are not kind of tied that well to what what is happening outside of those quick scenes. Like, for example, their car going on the road and they're having some trouble with the car and then they continue... Maybe I would have rearranged some of the some of it. Honestly, so, uh, some of the, uh, the those scenes could have been cut entirely. The only real travel scene that I think needed to remain uh, was the uh, the scene where they crossed into Botswana, which also I thought was a was a fairly funny uh, scene. But the yeah. reason it needed to to remain was to purely to give the context of they're now in Botswana, everything's he- uh, heading to. Uh, uh, to towards each other because otherwise that scene could have been cut too hmm, yeah and maybe you you could cut uh cut it off with, uh with a little radio uh, d- uh d- doing a convenient announcer uh, telling that uh, telling them that you know communist guerrilla san Borja and his group have entered Botswana illegally and are and are on their way to uh, mozambique or whatever maybe may- maybe now that you actually said it out that could have also helped to streamline the the film and the experience because with, with Buddhist group and for for example there's there's that no moment when Buddhist group cross the border the Botswana and and the kind of a, the military that is, that is chasing them gets pulled over and crashes with with the hut of the of the border guard and that that's where where they contact the radio the border guard uses the radio to contact his superior who then lets the military know that they cannot continue their their chase since they are they are they, that would mean that the military would take an armed force and cross the border and that's not allowed and that for example did not really serve that strong narrative purpose in the film it does kind of explain what happens to military, why why they 
disappear all of a sudden from the movie. But basically, when it comes to the major plot points, the next plot point is is when it's when Sam Poha takes the the school class as hostages, and you are shown that the local police at that point is, is the group that is trying to defuse the situation, is trying to to arrest Poha, and is incapable of doing that. But you really don't kind of need this the switch from the military to the police to have that happen. Like the military be, being unable to continue the, the, their chase of Poha, it does take the, the tank out of the equation. They can no longer use tank against Poha, but they also could have, wouldn't have been able to use the tank once Poha has the school class as hostages. Yeah, on, honestly, Poha's whole group could have uh, probably just been introduced a- early on the radio and they uh, they could have been introduced far later uh, in, into the film than, than they were because everything before the, uh, them them at the, at the school was really just trying to keep the uh, keep them in the film so you uh, so you haven't forgotten about them but they're not doing anything until, uh, until they t- uh, until they take over the school and so if you just had mentions of them be, uh, beforehand that uh, that probably would have served the same purpose. Maybe even mention, yeah, you know, have have the the main characters men, mention that that they're in the area that they've got into uh, into Botswana and just being mildly concerned about uh, about this so that it doesn't come entirely out of nowhere. That's quite good structural analysis, I must say. <laughs> Holy shit! You should most definitely visit this podcast more often. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Like uh, I was just about to say at some point that yeah, the flick lab is really, really sometimes as good as it is because some fantastic guests. <laughs> oh, thank you. <laughs> but so, I guess we, we still have to tackle the. You really know you're watching the guards must be crazy when. When you have started to repurpose your Coca-Cola bottles for cooking your entercut <laughs> beef, I, I I'm also with uh, with the Coca-Cola bottle take. <laughs> you really know you are watching the guards must be crazy when you casually tr- drink a Coke and cause a social political catastrophe. <laughs> <laughs> oh well, I did I did something a little bit different and, and, and a lot more boring. You really know you're watching when Andrew Stain drops something. <laughs> It's al- almost every uh, every scene he, he uh, he's in, he drops something. <laughs> so what about those three adjectives? Hmm. Intriguing cultural crevice in the sense that there's a bit of a crevice in understanding the film. Also, that's a double entendre because uh, 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 of the crevice where they hide. Yeah, true. Henrik. Uh, mine would be ridiculous and not necessarily in a good way. Unfortunately, but yet still, still somehow in some odd way, very interesting. And that the final is actually, I guess you and me, we are going to have to share that cultural because that's my third adjective. I only came up with two adjectives. I got, mm-hmm. I, I got absurd and thought provoking. Very accurate. The the entirety of the of the of the comedy was just absurdist and, uh, and, and even even when it was slapstick it was still just absurd slapstick it's it it wouldn't happen in real life every every item that uh, uh every well, like big comedy item that that happened we, uh, you'd have got almost there in real life and then and then saved it and then someone would have said oh man wouldn't it have just been dreadful if x had happened uh, definitely send me a text message if this ever happens in real life in Botswana. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, but then it was thought provoking because it did at the time with, without without making me the main character because ooh, that would not have gone over well with the apartheid government. Still allow him to be the the hero, but it but he was the hero that no one could admit was the hero it it's something that i definitely w- uh, would not have recognized as uh, uh, as as a child 
but uh, but as an adult, uh, having having rewatched this, he is the hero th- uh, uh, th- throughout, and it's to, uh, and everyone else is just busy trying to take credit, and the, and then um, a- Andrew is taking credit for, uh, for 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 what he does, but the hunting lodge guy Jack Hind is also then trying to take credit from Andrew, and and so. Figuring out, you know, who who's who's actually sol- solving the, uh, the the mysteries in this and and, and putting together all the, all the stuff makes you think a little bit more more about your preconceived notions also of of who should be the main character mm. or the hero, I guess. Very thought provoking reply. <laughs> and more thought provoking replies we can have with the question, which is ye- yes or no. Did you guys check your watches? Twice. I didn't, but I still felt quite frustrated at some po- some moments in the film. Yeah, there, there were there were two points in the movie where, uh, where I, I I didn't check my watch. I checked I, I checked the the timestamp on, on the movie because I was like, I was like when when's when when's that school scene coming up? Be- uh, because I already sort of knew that that was when it it it, it sort of came uh, came together. Once that happened, it felt like the movie just immediately was going at a at a rapid pace, and the, and, and the, ev- everything was uh, was happening. Bef- before that, there were twice when, two two points when I felt like Mm-mm, this is this is taking a while. I didn't know what to expect from the film when I uh, when I saw this one, and that may have actually helped me because I also did not check my watch. I don't know if, if if I would have had the pre knowledge of of the school scene, and I, if I had known that that's going to happen, like we are going to have a big action set piece, also in in the finality of the film, maybe that could have also for me kind of a it, it might might have affected how I approach the film, and I may have also been more impatient with the movie and check my watch a couple of times. I think another part of it is just that it it was paced well for uh, for movies made in in the nineteen eighties, but the pace of movies today is much faster. And I, I watch I, I sometimes watch old, old movies, but I mostly watch mo- uh, modern stuff. And so the pacing felt a little bit sl- uh, uh, sl- uh, slow for me as a modern viewer. Because as a, as a kid, I, I I never felt it was slow. Yeah, there's one point to look at in this podcast. We could Henrik do Rosemary's Baby one day. That could be like one of the prime targets for discussing <laughs> if it is slow or not. <laughs> that that's uh, also a film that comes with a couple of problematic problematic talk pieces with it. The first one being the subject matter and basically the Anthony Lavey, and the second one being the goddamn director himself. Yeah. But that's out of the boundaries of this episode, so what's next? <laughs> the next one, I, I guess, is the most dreaded question. It's it's the main question we have to ask and give answers to. And this is something that really is a nightmare whenever we have a ge- guess that. That's, that has made it clear that, that the film in question is, is his or hers favorite movie, because... Oh, I wouldn't call it my favorite movie. <laughs> Would you guys recommend tonight's movie? <laughs> no, I, I wouldn't, unfortunately. And there it comes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, l- like, there is, of course, what I'm willing to overlook, the audio track, which is a mess, at least for the international audience. And then there is the very obvious and stylistic choice of having this fast-forwarded video. There is the humor, as said, is very slapsticky and often not very funny, but there are moments of true hilariousness, as stated. But as we have also stated at nauseum, the plot could have been more better pre- prepared. I feel that it's jumping around in between different subplots. And maybe that's also something that it wants to do, that the, it's stylistically kind of different when it starts and when it ends. It feels like some nature documentary first, and then it turns out to be kind of gorilla adventure 
with guns and then at one point it's about this one tribes guy who 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 tries to survive in this new environment i just got a little disjointed feeling so i do think that the um the uh the nature documentary uh part of it was definitely an attempt to parody those uh, uh nature documentaries and I feel like it didn't quite do it correctly, but I'm not sure if it's because it overdid it or underdid it. Uh, maybe it could have played it even more throughout the film, because it for the last for the second half of the film, it seems that the nature documentary kind of dies off. Yeah, I think maybe if they'd then started applying that same narrator voice of it being a a, a nature documentary to people like Stain and and they they, they could have yeah. added the added the narrative voice and fixed the not all of but a lot of the, the problems with uh Stain and and Thompson's uh, relationship by having it as a na- nature documentary of now the uh, yes. the adult human he, and he, he's go, going for uh he's doing his mating display or, or, or whatever and and got got also a few more laughs out of that I was kind of expecting that, and if that would have actually happened, it would have kind of made it for even for the audiences, because now the narrator voice is mostly making just fun of the at the expense of the sun people. Yeah, I, I think I, I think that may have been the intention, but there's no way that that movie w- uh, wouldn't have been censored in South in South Africa if it uh, if it had done that. So maybe it, maybe it's a victim of the politics of it of its time on that, or maybe they just didn't want to do that. Yeah, but when it comes to this film and uh, liking it or disliking it or recommending not recommending, I would say that the biggest obstacle here is that it's just not funny enough. Or maybe I had too big expectations for it being one of the funniest films on earth. To be honest, I really didn't have ex- expectations, but to carry on with the film for two hours and it not being very funny, which is what it's supposed to be, that's why no recommendation. My opinion is kind of a mess, to, to be completely honest, because I'm really teetering on between g- giving this this a very careful recommendation and not recommending it. Like I'm really torn between these two. Like, oh come on, sh- really? Should I should I give it a slip or should I keep the more harsher route and just not give it give it a recommendation? I kind of look at it this way: Would I watch this film again? I probably won't return to this film. Yeah, and I I I might have a little bit different take that you than you. I mean, I I'm. In the end, I'm I'm also on no recommendation camp. But. That k- kind of because because like like you, I didn't find the film funny enough, and I didn't find the story interesting enough to to merit it a recommendation. When it comes to me, would I look at the film again at some point? I I guess like I I can see that I would return to this film someday. Because even though I didn't find it funny as a comedy, even though I won't be recommending it, it's it's not actually like it kind of is a bad film as a comedy because I didn't laugh not once really with, with the movie. I it did get a couple of chuckles out of me, but I I wasn't like like bursting out of laughter laughter when I was watching it. But at the same time, in a way, it's really interesting movie to watch like there, there is a lot a lot of th- things that i kind of liked seeing i did like his story arc and even that story arc, it had it did have a bunch of nonsense in it like the middle part once he leaves the mi- village and he's just wandering in the in towards the civilization and there is he for example first comes in contact with with car i i felt that that was kind of a pointless scene, and I would have easily just cut it off from the, from the film. But I, but I did enjoy the arc in in the sense he leaves the village, he meets the the white characters, he helps to defuse the situation with the hostages and sa- saves the group, and then finally reaches the quote unquote edge of the world and finally gets rid of the coke bottle. Like I, I, I enjoyed that arc. There's just bunch of nonsense 
amidst those main points that I didn't really care, care for. And all of that really kind of makes this this an interesting film to see. There is a, it's also interesting to see kind of a, what type of film comes out of out of South Africa and have this lightweight, heartfelt comedy, which I didn't feel that had any ill intent in it. Even though there are there are those tropes that we have talked about, I in no way did I ever feel that that there was bad intent behind them, and that yeah. that all kind of kind of ties into this this feeling that that if you are a cinephile and if you are inter- interested in these types of films, you kind of do well for yourself if you check this one out. I I even liked the fact that even though this comes from from a car country that was was being torn apart by the apartheid co- government the film itself kind of takes very liberal very humane look at look at the world and and it doesn't really even take part in the apartheid discussion i think that's also part of why they said it in botswana to avoid that it, it can mm. very much be that there is something there there's kind of levity and there, there, there is this kind of an easygoing attitude that you can get from watching a film that comes from a from a problematic region on a problematic period of time that still does n- is not about the politics of that place and time. Like it, it makes an kind of an enjoyable viewing experience, even if the film fails as a comedy. So if if you check this out, I I do kind of a see that a cinephile does well seeing this film. But if you would just be scrolling down the Netflix playlist and and the cards must be crazy would show up on the playlist, I would not be pointing out that, hey, let's let's check out <laughs> the cards must be crazy. And therefore, also, unfortunately, no recommendation from my end. Wow. <laughs> I, I guess I'm the only one who does recommend it, although, again, with caveats. Um, I would recommend it as a fun film as long as you don't have expectations about it. Um, it uh, I, I thoroughly enjoyed what, uh, uh, what, watching it again. I haven't watched it in probably 10 years. But it's... It, I, I I wouldn't call it a model film or a, anything ne- uh, near a model film. I would a, 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 I would call it sort of a, a good way to waste a couple of hours. If you want if you're wanting to really like dive into South African cinema or, or movie set in, in, in South Africa, there are better cho- uh, choices to make. Although not, none, at least as as far as I know, that that aren't at least partially for, sort of externally funded by american or or, or british uh, uh, film mm. houses but you know if, if if you want if you want to understand like what 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 do south africans like it uh, in 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 a uh, in a movie or or what what it, or if you just have one film to to watch about south africa then then it's probably uh, i'd probably more recommend the invictus or or or, or, or something like uh, like this but and so, so there, because there is so much good f- uh, uh, f- film out there, it makes it hard to say, oh yeah, you should definitely go, go and watch that. But if anyone's interested in it, I, I would I would say uh, go, go in ex- expecting nothing, and you'll and you'll enjoy yourself. You're not going to get top quality cinema or anything, but but I I think you uh, you'll, you'll get. And you, and and it's certainly not going to be as uh, as funny as the, uh, the reviews make it out to be. But I think you'll get something that that you can in, enjoy spending your your time on. Uh, Matt, in Finland we have this film called Tuntematon Sotilas or Unknown Soldier, and there has been actually many versions made of it over the years. But nevertheless, the original and the original book those are kind of the national treasures of. Finland. Unknown Soldier is the kind of film that is being played on TV every single Independence Day. Do you guys have something similar then that you would recommend? Um, so, so a, a, as far as having the biggest impact on South African culture, although, although it, it, I mean, it, it was a, 
I think a box office success, but not really a, a you know a, a hugely selling uh, story. But I think it I think it made a profit. Would probably be Sarafina. Um, okay. It, it's it, it's it's about the Soweto uh, uprising, but as much as this movie tried to be uh, uh, to be lighthearted, Serafina is anything but. It is very mm. much a it's it's a think piece made into a movie, and it's very culturally significant to, uh, uh, for, for for South Africa, but it's it's also very heavy. <laughs> Maybe that's a film we should check out someday. And also maybe get us also a guest, maybe a returning guest from from the episode from some previous episode for the unknown soldier <laughs> soldier episode. Yeah, yeah. The, we have a pretty great idea with Henrik for that that episode who could be as a guest, don't we? If if, if you are still game with that plan, I I guess we do. Oh, man, yeah. I'm thoroughly uh, uh, curious now. Don't worry, I'll, I'll I'll listen and and I'll and I'll hear the answer there. <laughs> Will be great. All right, Henrik, any anything special now, or should I head to outro? I guess we can simply head to outro at this point. Matt, anything special at this point? No, just thank you for having me. It was wonderful to uh, to uh, chat with, uh, about this movie uh, with you, and I it made me think of a lot of things about it that I'd never really considered. Oh wow, we have been useful. Yeah, mo- most definitely, Matt. Thank you for for coming here tonight. Yeah, because oh, yeah, yeah. yeah, because you really did help us a lot to a- a- actually go through this film and and have a really kind of a more intelligent discussion around the film than what it most likely would have been if it would have simply been me and Kari. Well, you're you're most welcome. I'm I'm glad I, uh, that I could be useful to you guys. You most definitely were. I'm very much stepping out of my uh, uh, my comfort zone for this, but when it gave me an opportunity to to see a movie that I had watched so much growing up and hadn't seen it in, uh, in so, uh, so long, I decided to jump on it. Well, yeah, really happy to hear that that our podcast was something that you were you were willing to go out of your comfort zone for. Yeah. So indeed. really, yeah, really. Thank you, thank you for for thank being you. with us. Yeah, I I really appreciate how how welcoming the uh, the, the two of you have been and just willing to go in with to, to the discussion and and show me an entirely different perspective on a movie that I'd never had a different perspective on. <laughs> so <laughs> great pleasure. All right, dear listeners, thank you for joining us, and uh, if you enjoyed the show. Please give us a rating on iTunes because it helps a lot. But you can also follow us on all the major abominations of the civilization. Facebook, YouTube, Instagram and Twitter. We of course still have the International Cinema Challenge running here throughout the year 2019. And it's about to end in the next Cinema Challenge episode with the Unknown Soldier episode when we will look at our second Finnish film in this podcast long time coming and that's what we finish off with on the Finnish Independence Day week but next week dear listeners we will do License to Kill Timothy Dalton's second and unfortunately last outing as James Bond I would say so I know back your sharks and machetes and until then and le dimos una linda luna de miel adios